training computer is kind of like the engine, how many, this horsepower of the engine. So you really, you want to try to do the best on that. And you then, um, then so how efficiently do you use that to train and compute? And how efficiently do you do the inference, the uh, use of the AI? Um, so obviously that comes down to human talent. Um, and then what unique access to data do you have? Uh, that's also plays a, plays a role. You think Twitter data will be useful? Uh, yeah, I mean, <laughs> I think I think most of the leading AI companies already have already scraped uh, the, all the Twitter data. <laughs> uh, not I think they have. Um, so I don't know, on a go forward basis, what's yes. useful is is the is the fact that it's uh, up to the second. You know, yes. that's the uh, because they, they, it's hard for them to scrape in real time. So there's there's a an, an immediacy advantage that Grok has already. I think with Tesla and, and the real-time video coming from the several million cars, ultimately tens of millions of cars with Optimus, there might be hundreds of millions of Optimus robots, maybe billions, learning a tremendous amount from the real world. Uh, that's that's the, the biggest source of data, I think ultimately is, is sort of Optimus probably. Is, Optimus is gonna be the biggest source of data. Because it's Because re reality scales. <laughs> <laughs> reality scales to the scale of reality. <laughs> um, it's actually humbling to see how little data humans have actually been able to accumulate. Um, really, if you say how many trillions of usable tokens have humans generated where on a non-duplicative, like discounting s spam and repetitive stuff, it's not a huge number. You run out pretty quickly. And Optimus can go, so Tesla cars can are unfortunately have to stay on the road. Uh, Optimus right. robot can go anywhere. And there's <laughs> yeah. more reality off the road and go yeah, off road. I, I mean, like the Optimus robot can like pick up the cup and see did it pick up the cup in the right way? Did it? Yeah. You know, say you know, pour water in the cup. You know, yeah. did the water go in the cup or not go in the cup? Did it spill water or not? Yeah. Um, Simple stuff like that. I mean, but, but it can do at that at scale times a billion, you know. So generate use, useful data from reality. So it co cause and effect stuff. What do you think it takes to get to mass production of humanoid robots like that? It's the same as cars, really. I mean, global capacity for vehicles um, is about 100 million a year. And uh, it could, it could be higher, it's just that the demand is on the order of 100 million a year. And then there's roughly 2 billion uh, vehicles that are in use in some way. So, uh, which makes sense, like the, the life of a vehicle is about 20 years. So at steady state, you can have 100 million vehicles produced a year with a, with a 2 billion vehicle fleet, roughly. Um, now for humanoid robots, the utility is much greater. So my guess is humanoid robots are more like at a, a, a billion plus per year. But you know, until you came along and started uh, building Optimus, it, it was thought to be an extremely difficult problem. I mean, still well, I it's it an extremely difficult yes. problem. So it's no walk in the park. I mean, Optimus currently would struggle to have a, to walk in the park. <laughs> I mean, it, it can walk in yeah. a park, but park is not too difficult, but it, it will be able to walk um, over a wide range of terrain. Yeah, and pick up objects. Yeah, yeah, it can already do that. But like all kinds of objects, yeah, yeah, all foreign objects. I mean, pouring water in a cup is not trivial because then, if you don't know anything about the container, it could be all kinds of containers. Yeah, there's going to be an immense amount of engineering just going into the hand. Yeah, the hand might be, it might be close to half of all the engineering in the in, in Optimus from an electromechanical standpoint. The hand is probably r roughly half of the engineering. But so much of the intelligence, so much the intelligence of humans goes into what we do with our hands. Yeah. It's just the manipulation of the world, manipulation of objects in the world, intelligence, safe manipulation of objects in the world. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you, you, you start really thinking about your hand and how it works. <laughs> you know, I do all the time. The sensory control of homunculus is we have like humongous hands. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, like your hands, the actuators, the muscles of your hand are almost overwhelmingly in your forearm. Mm -hmm. So your forearm has the has the muscles that that actually control your hand. Um, this, there's a there's a few small muscles in the hand itself, but your hand is really um, like a skeleton meat puppet, <laughs> and the, and and with cables. 
that so the, the muscles that control your fingers are in your forearm and they go through your, the carpal tunnel which is that you've got a little collection of bones and, and a tiny tunnel that the that these cables the tendons go through and those tendons are what um mostly what move your hands and something like those tendons has to be re engineered into the optimus in order yeah. to do all that kind of stuff yeah so like the, the, the current optimus um we, we tried putting the actuators in the hand itself <laughs> but then you, you you sort of end, end up having these like giant hands yeah giant hands that look weird yeah um, and then they they don't actually have enough degrees of freedom and and or enough strength mm -hmm. so so then you realize oh, okay that's why you got to put the actuators in the forearm and and just like a human you got to run cables uh through a, a narrow tunnel to uh, operate the, the fingers. And then there's also a reason for not having all the fingers uh, the same length. So it wouldn't be expensive from an energy or evolutionary standpoint to have all your fingers be the same length. So why aren't they the same length? Yeah, why not? Because it's actually better to have different lengths. Your dexterity is better if you've got fingers of different length. You, and you, you're, you have, there, there are more things you can do and your, your dexterity is actually better if your fingers are of different, different length. Like there's a reason you've got a little finger. Like why not have a little finger that's bigger? Yeah, because it allows you to do fine. It, it helps you with fine motor skills. That this little finger helps. <laughs> it does. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> but if you lost your little finger, it would you, you have noticeably less dexterity. So as you're figuring out this problem, you have to also figure out a way to do it so you can mass manufacture it. So it's to be as simple as possible. It's actually going to be quite complicated. I, the, the 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 as possible part is it's quite a high bar. If you want to have a humanoid robot that can. Um, do things that a human can do, it's actually, it's a, it's a very high bar. So our, our new arm has 22 degrees of freedom instead of 11, and has the, like I said, the actuators in the forearm. Um, and these all, all the actuators are designed from scratch, the from physics first principles, um, that the sensors are all designed from scratch. And, and we'll, we'll continue to put um, a tremendous amount of engineering effort into improving the hand, like the, the, the hand, by, by hand, I mean like the, the, the entire forearm from elbow forward. Mm -hmm. Uh, is is really the hand, um, so that's um, incredibly difficult engineering, actually. <laughs> and um, and so and so the simplest possible version of a humanoid robot that can do even most, perhaps not all, of what a human can do is actually still still very complicated. It's not it's not simple. It's very difficult. <laughs>